Um, all right, really quick. Film Gold has some required reading. And I'm not really going to talk about any of it because it is barely even connected to Film Gold. There's a TV special called Heart of Gold, which is an entirely different story that barely connects to Film Gold. There is also an entire filler arc called the Silver Mine arc in which uh, the characters of Film Gold uh, appear for like two scenes and they're like not important. We could have cut them out entirely and nothing would change from that filler arc. So I'm just not going to talk about them. At all. Maybe they're gonna get their own dedicated thing at one point, but probably not. If there was one thing I could say about this movie, it's that it's very yellow. There is so much gold everywhere throughout all of the movie. This movie is trying to be a visual spectacle. It has possibly one of the cheesiest One Piece deliveries in all of the media so far. We're actually broke. Throughout the entire movie, there's this thought in the back of my head that kept thinking, this is uh, too much. You want to fight? Then bring it on. Every character in this movie has like a quip or a line of dialogue or like a gotcha that I, it's so out of place in One Piece. Don't get me wrong, there's a lot of moments in One Piece that go hard, but it never felt like we were intentionally always trying to write lines that went hard. Your spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak. So this movie can be summarized as flashy and kind of gimmicky from top to bottom. And to be fair, I think that entirely fits within the theme of the story. The entire movie takes place in the Grand Tesoro, which is like this casino that is standing on a ship made of gold being pushed by two giant turtles, which it's a cool concept. And right from the get-go, it has just an opening set piece being like, hey, Check this out. As soon as you enter both the ship island and the movie, you are immediately brought into a performance. Something that the main villain of this movie is very good at. He sees, oh, the Straw Hats are here. They're now the main lead in the play. And everything tries to focus around that. I swear, half of this movie is just cool set pieces. In the beginning, everyone's fighting in the midst of the song. The giant golden ship, seemingly for fun, is throwing endless amounts of liquid gold. Later on, we see a fantastic race, which takes place throughout the entire casino. You get to make your own vehicles and everything, and one that frankly causes so much property damage and safety hazards. The plotline for Film Gold is relatively simple. If I had to summarize this movie, it's that the crew got sucked up into the dream of winning big in a casino and then get hit with the reality of crippling debt. Which leads to one of my favorite set pieces, a spectacular heist in an attempt to get back their winnings and more. And it's cool, it's interesting to see these characters utilize a different aspect of their toolkit, which it feels like they don't really get a chance to do in the normal story. And this weird setup for a heist allows you to have these characters do things in this situation that normally they wouldn't be able to. This movie created very weird questions that I've never thought about before. Like, how would Luffy handle the ethics of casinos? How would he handle debt? He got pretty upset that he lost the bet when someone used the luck luck fruit to change his odds, but would he be okay if he lost that actually on his own without the intervention of the luck luck fruit? He didn't really have a problem taking money when he was winning, but would Luffy be upset if he was allowed to continue playing with good luck given to him by the luck luck fruit? And if Luffy is mad about the odds being against you, isn't that, uh, just a regular casino? Except this time if you lose, you gain a generational debt. People's families are put on the line, their kids are forced into labor. The people are forced to entertain customers in order to not get punished in a system where gamblers lose everything and have to pay to a system that is inherently exploiting them. The Soto's whole backstory revolves around the idea of wealth and status as that has seemingly been the one thing that has been setting him back. Whether it's his own lack of money or the celestial dragons interfering or a mixture of both. And it is that sensitivity to money and wealth that makes DeSoto a tragic villain whose desire for possession ultimately turned him into a villain. The entirety of DeSoto's backstory, just in general, is depressing. 
It's kind of hard not to have one that's depressing with celestial dragons being a thing. So there's one scene in particular that I think is a pretty good thesis for this movie, and it occurs in the high betting area where only the most expensive players are. Here is where we find a lot of the marines who have seemingly been bought out by the Soto, because one of the main things that the Soto believes is that wealth validates purpose. And no matter what your stance is on justice, your ethics, wealth changes your ethics. And that is seen by the world government deeming Gran Tesoro as an accepted nation. A lot of this within itself is made clear through Tesoro's backstory. The second theme from the scene is when Luffy loses the bet and finds out that he's been tricked. Tesoro and his entire crew says, be smarter about us. Where the entire casino is built up to be a living contradiction of wealth and chance and at the same time is a cover built off of lies and deception. Normally, Luffy is very forward on his approach against others, going so far as to play by other people's rules even when those rules seem to be contradictory or even lies. So I find it interesting that the story does dive into lies and deception through the heist, while keeping Luffy staying true to himself by just not telling him anything. Alright, let's turn this slightly around by talking about some of the side characters. There is a range of them. I think Vesoda is the most fleshed out character in this entire movie. He has the ability to turn anything into gold and manipulate gold. And yet he is very unsympathetic. Kind of a monkey paw situation. He's very King Midas. But there's also a lot of fun characters like Baccarat who has the ability to change people's luck. It's a very weird ability because it forces you to come up with the fact that luck might be a real thing in One Piece. Like a real measurable thing. And uh, because of that, her fights lead to some of the most creative problem solving fights. There's also these kids that are forced to pay off their debts and they're out there selling flowers and they're not all that unique, but I like their design. You got angry kid and like sympathetic girl and that's very cookie cutter in terms of character designs, but I like it too much to go against it. So they're cool. There's a revolutionary army member down in the pits of Tesoro's chambers and that character is a little bit weird, but I find him so charming. They're only really a character to push forward the story for Luffy to give hope to someone and for that someone to give that hope back to Luffy. But at the same time, they're one of my favorite characters in this movie. I never thought that having a character be in debt would be so cool. Somehow this character milked out so many dramatic moments and made me cheer for them. In this movie, we also get Nami's teammate, which is someone who she used to work with. Frankly, it's a little bit weird being like, oh yeah, we were totally buddies in the past, given the fact that we didn't see any of that. But given her backstory and the fact that they are kind of in salty territory where Nami wouldn't really want to even talk to her, I think it's a believable enough addition. And the movie goes through great lengths to try to justify this character as someone who Nami simultaneously feels betrayed by and also trusts. As someone who ultimately did the right thing, but within a selfish exterior, like getting everyone off the Grand Tesoro so they don't have to be on this island anymore, only for her to take it all for herself. Okay, can we talk about a forced plotline in Film Gold? This is a sad but required section, which is what I feel like they said in the writing room. Let's talk about the forced plotline of Rob Lucci, Spandex, and Sabo in Film Gold. Look, I get it. These characters were brought in because they have appeal. Lucci? Yeah, he's cool. You want to see more Lucci, don't you? We'll put him in the movie. Sabo? I wonder what his moveset is now. Let's put him in the movie. You want to have Sabo and Lucci fight? Yeah, that would be cool. And you know what? It was cool. I was invested. Now, was it really a satisfying storyline? No. And that's kind of like the one sour spot of Film Gold for me. We introduce Rob Lucci and Spandex and Sabo because I feel like we wanted to utilize them, but we never really have a time to highlight them. It never gets the highlighted time that we can only really see in a movie like this. It's like you brought these characters in, but you don't really want to reveal too much. So we don't really get much of anything from them, and that's kind of painful. But there is a whole subsection of this story dedicated to Rob Lucci and Sabo, which seemingly get dropped after Tesoro has met his fate. That's the one sour spot, but it's a memorable movie. You're going to remember uh, a lot of yellow. There's so much yellow. Uh, the entire movie is almost entirely yellow. It's all yellow.